Greetings, Pastor Chris with you again for another midweek Bible devotional. I hope you're doing well. Uh, a special welcome to you if this is the first time you're watching one of these. Maybe this showed up in your YouTube feed and you uh, clicked on it. And I do hope that you find it um, a blessing and um, encouraging to you at the same time. Uh, for this study, we're going to look at the first couple of chapters of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, it's one of the historical books in the Old Testament comes right after Ezra. Uh, so uh, if you um, have your Bible with you, then open up to Nehemiah 1. If you don't, then this would be a good time to just pause the video and go get your Bible or open it up on a computer or your tablet or your phone, whatever whatever way you read Scripture. It doesn't matter <laughs> as long as you get to it. Uh, again, we're being uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. Uh, of course, I like to use a good old-fashioned book, <laughs> a Bible with pages in it. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay. If you want to use something else, as long as it works, I don't care. <laughs> I'll be using the uh, ESV version for this uh, this study uh, this time around. Okay, so Nehemiah 1. Now, I'm not going to read the whole passage. We're just going to work our way through it. And um, I think before we even do that, um, let's just uh, start with a little bit of a question. Um, when you get some bad news or you encounter some difficulty... Uh, trials and tribulations, as as the Bible calls them often. Um, maybe it's uh, somebody sinned against you, so so something's something's happened um, that that's just uh, uh, distressing news to you. What's the first thing do you do, that you do? Do you take it upon yourself to go remedy the problem? Do you try to fix it? Uh, and, and just relying on your own understanding and not trusting in the Lord? Boy, that sounds like Proverbs 3, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it is. Um, so it, it's, it is something that we normally do. We, we normally try to solve whatever the problem is, whatever the difficulty is. I know for men, that's probably the, more often the case. We just want to go in and fix it. <laughs> whatever it might be, we're going to fix it. It could be it could be even to try to retaliate against somebody that's done something wrong against us. Uh, so, so keep that in mind, because we're going to see here out of Nehemiah, who was a great leader, um, he didn't take that approach. And of course, we know of, from Proverbs 3 that I just mentioned, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and, and uh, lean not on your own understanding. Uh, it's the same concept. It's, it's the same concept. So, so we're going to take a look here at Nehemiah 1. And let's just take a look at uh, verses 1 through 3, because this is the setup for the whole thing. So Nehemiah 1, 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So he was asking about his kinsmen. How, how are the Jews, how are our people doing? How are they doing? They've been released from exile. They're in Jerusalem. How are they doing? And the response he got was not good news. It says the remnant there, the, the, the few people that went to Jer Jerusalem after the exile. A lot of people think that like when the exile was lifted by King Cyrus, that, oh, they all got in buses and went back, right? That's not how it went. Actually, a very small number of them went back in the beginning. Because they had lived in exile so long that they'd really become residents wherever they were. So, so there was, they were like, why would I want to leave? <laughs> and have to go back and rebuild the city. But there was a remnant of faithful that went back. So the remnant there in, in this is verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So to Nehemiah, this is distressing news. This is terrible news. This is heartbreaking news. But it sounds like, you know, if, if you're a great leader of men, what's the first thing you do? Well, let's go. We've got to go in there and help them. We've got to go fix this. We've got to, we've got to take care of them. We've got to rebuild the city. We have to do it now. Nehemiah couldn't do that. And I'm just going to skip a little bit to show you why. The very last verse of chapter 1 says... Now I was cupbearer to the king. That was a very important job. He couldn't just get up and leave. He was the cupbearer, meaning he brought the, the wine to the king to drink. If it was poisoned, he would have been the one to find out the hard way. <laughs> so, so basically, the, the king's life was in his hands. It was a very important position uh, to, to hold in, 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 in that kind of a, that kind of a, in, in a palace if you were serving a king. So, so that was... 
That was Nehemiah's position. So he couldn't just get up and go, even if he wanted to. Now, of course, we might, like today, we might just run the job and I'm, I'm out of here. I got to go take care of something. That's the way we are, right? That, that's kind of like our, 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 our instinct is to go do that. But listen now, let's read verse 4 together. Verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, as soon as I heard these words, did he get up and go? Listen to what he did. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down. I sat down. He didn't go anywhere. He did not go anywhere. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. So he let his his emotions respond. He let, let it all humble him. He wept and he mourned for days. He got this bad news about his country folk, right? He got this bad news about Jerusalem. And he wept and he mourned. He was humbled by this, but he sat down. He didn't do anything. He let it humble him. And it says, and I continued fasting and praying, praying before the God of heaven. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So what's the first thing he did? He prayed. The first thing he did was he prayed. He didn't do anything. He didn't go anywhere. He prayed. Now, Wes, we're going to just kind of skim through his prayer. It begins in verse 5. Um, and the beginning of it, he starts off really with worship. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So right out of the gate, he worships God. He worships God. God, in the midst of all this, 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 this horrible situation, this terrible news, he weeps, he's humbled, and he worships God. That's the first thing he does. And as we go through the prayer a little bit further, it says, um, uh, uh, we're going to pick it up here now. I pray before you night and day for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've corrupt, ver, acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So the next thing he does is he confesses sin. He worshiped God, came into his presence, and he confesses sin. Much like we do in our church service too, right? We, we're in worship and then we confess our sin. You're in the presence of God. You can't help but confess your sin. So, so that's, that's what he did. Now we go a little further into his prayer. In verse 8, he says, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name do all there. So the next thing he does is he rehearses the promises of God. He rehearses the goodness of God. He remembers, he recalls the things that God did and promised. So, so that's what he's doing there. Like he's saying, you know, remember God? It's kind of like, remember this to happen? It's really for him. Of course God remembers. He's just doing this to really kind of rehearse it for himself. Um, now we go to the very, very end of the prayer. Okay, we're in verse 11. Uh, o Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer by your, of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give, here's, here's his request, and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, this man he's talking about is the king that he's serving. So, so Nehemiah knew he had to do something. And he knew he had to be in Jerusalem. He knew that. But, of course, he couldn't go. And he didn't want to go without going to God first. So this is what he does, right? He, he sits down. He stops, right? And he is humbled. And then he prays, and his prayer starts with worship. It starts. It goes to confession, and it goes to to rehearsing the goodness of God. And then at the very end, here's my need. Here's my request to you, God. So now in chapter two, we see in the beginning of it that he's he's going about. And it's after it says gives another another time period. I don't know how many months after this this takes place. So in, in he he says, it says here that. He was sad. He was still sad over what was going on. So after the, the, the king saw that his face was sad, the king, the king asked, well, why? And he said, why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lie in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So now he, he tells the king, this is why I'm sad. 
and of course he is. Now, watch how watch what happens here. He says, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? He hadn't even requested anything or even hinted at a request. He just said, I'm sad because my, my, my kinsfolk that are gone to Jerusalem have uh, places in ruins, and I'm sad about that. And he says here, so I prayed to the God of heaven. He <laughs> prayed to God because the king asked, what is do you want? All right, Lord, what is it I want to tell him? And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant is found favor in your sight, then you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So there's his request. There's his request. And as we go on, if you want to, we can just skip ahead. Uh, he asked for letters so he could have safe transport to get there so nobody would, would, would arrest him or bother him for doing this. But look at the very end of that section. This is the very end of verse, the second half of verse 8. It says, And the king granted me what I asked. The king granted me what I asked. And why? For the good hand of my God was upon me. So, so let's, again, just kind of recap. What is it that, that, that Nehemiah did here? What, what, what is it that, that, that he, how did he handle this whole situation? He got the terrible news. He stopped. He was humbled. He wept, right? He was humbled. He prayed. And his prayer was filled with worship. It was filled, it was filled with confession. It was, it was filled with rehearsing the goodness of God. And then it had his small little request that God would just grant him favor, Right? And then he goes before the king. Later on is another opportunity. There's not, the, the door opens is the opportunity. He's sad. The king says, why so sad? And he says, because the, the city of my, my forefathers is destroyed. What are you asking for? Well, he wasn't there. Of course, he, there's the door that God opened up. And he again he says, son, I prayed. He prayed again. And then God, he, he spoke. I, dare I say that the Holy Spirit put words in his mouth? <laughs> but he spoke. And then what happened? The king granted everything he wanted. Everything. He let his cupbearer, a very important job, just go. Go ahead. Go take care of those people. Go do what you have to do. Go rebuild that city. So what do, what do we get out of this? How do, we, how do we interpret this for ourselves? How do we apply it to our lives? Well, the first thing we ask ourselves, are we struggling with something? Has somebody done something really seriously wrong to us or grievously wrong? Or a situation has come upon us that is, that is terrible. That's bad. medical conditions, financial conditions, whatever it might be. Something has happened. Is our first response to go fix it? Is our first response to worry? Is our first response to, to run away? No, our first response should be to stop, should sit down, humble ourselves before our Heavenly Father, and then pray. Pray earnestly to Him. And we, what do we do? We worship Him. We praise Him. We give Him all the honor and the glory because He deserves it. He's God. He's our sovereign God. We acknowledge His sovereignty first. And then we confess our sin because you can't help it when you're in front of your holy God. You confess your sin, whatever it might be. There may be something you, you haven't confessed yet. We, <laughs> or to, listen, the fact you're even moving around, you've, you've probably sinned. So, so because you confess your sin to Him, acknowledge that you're not holy like He is. You're, you're, you're still in your fallen condition. And then rehearse his goodness. Rehearse the goodness of God that he showed you through Christ. You've confessed your sin and now rehearse that goodness. Jesus went to the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Thank you for, for suffering the wrath of God for me. If it was not for your shed blood, I would not even be able to go to God and pray. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as he's shed his blood, you can rehearse this. You've shed your blood. I can now come to you. That, that's a wonderful thing. I have the assurance of eternal life. You can continue to just remind yourself in prayer of what God has done for you, the grace he's shown you, and the mercy he's shown you. And then, then place your request before him. By that point, you'll know it's whatever it is. It'll be a very simple, like, Lord, just give, bring relief, uh, uh, bring help, uh, bring assistance, bring whatever, you know, give me the words, whatever your request is. But it'll be a very, very short request because by that point, <laughs> you've done those other things. It's kind of like God already knows. You already know. It's like, God, just help me with this. You know, cause me to be able to handle this better or, or give me the right words I need to say, or whatever it might be. So, so, so we do that. If we do that, and then all we do is we wait for his answer. 
We wait for the opportunity, wait for the door to open, we, you know, to, to maybe share the gospel with somebody. We wait for, the, for, the, for, for God to provide whatever it might be. Uh, or we wait for the answer, which may be, no, that's not my will. That's not what's going to happen. But either way, we glorify God. We glorify him in whatever his response is. We don't get angry with him. <laughs> There's no need to. There's no need to. So, so, so that's, that's, that's really, I think, what, what this passage is really kind of telling us, right? Um, I also think when you look at it, in Nehemiah's case, what seemed impossible, you know, the job he had, he couldn't walk away from that. So it seemed impossible for him. Well, nothing's impossible for God. So God made it all possible. So there, there's, there's, I think, what we get out of this passage. We look at how Nehemiah prayed, how Nehemiah handled the situation, and we apply that to our lives. So I hope, I hope that was kind of encouraging to you. Let me just pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how perfect and complete and, and um, applicable your word is to our lives. So may we all um, stop when something happens. We just pause for a moment. We, we pray. We, we humble ourselves before you. And then we worship you. And we confess our sin to you. And we rehearse how good you are to us. And how good you've been to us. And then... We let our requests be known to you with thankful thankfulness. So, Father, we thank you again for all that you've done for us, and um, we thank you for your word that you've given to us today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, again, I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, I got a little long-winded in that, maybe a little too repetitious, but hopefully you got the, uh, the idea out of that. So, um, if this is the first time you've come across one of our videos, um, I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, if you would just um, give us a like and a subscribe, that would be great. That would help us in the YouTube algorithm so other folks can, can see this. And also there's a share button down there. Feel free to click on that. Maybe you can share this with somebody else that's struggling with something and maybe this would help them. Um, if you're also um, in the Collinsville, Connecticut area and you don't have a home church, then of course you're invited to come worship with us at Christ Community Church. Um, and that's in Collinsville, Connecticut. Uh, you can find out all the information you need to know about the church at our website, uh, ChristCommunityChurchCT.org, ChristCommunityChurchCT.org. That's also where you can, uh, if you're a little further away from the church, you can uh, watch us online. You can join us uh, live on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern Time uh, where you can worship. And it's, 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 make, if you do that, just make sure you check in and uh, somebody is manning that computer all through the service uh, so you will, people will respond to you. Um, but uh, it's just an opportunity for you to connect with our church uh, online if you need to, if you'd like to do that, if that works for you. And of course, the last thing is, is if you are a member of our church already or regular at, at Christ Community Church, then of course, uh, Lord willing, we will see you this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. Okay, so um, I hope again this was all helpful for you, it was encouraging to you, and uh, please leave a comment below and let me know. Let me know how, if this was something you needed to hear or was helpful to you in any way. So until next time, this is Pastor Chris Bauer from Christ Community Church in Collinsville, Connecticut. Be a blessing.